Hi, I'm Rebecca Larson, owner of TutorsDynasty.com, and this is my podcast. In today's episode, I will be discussing one of my favorite women at Tudor Court, the fearless Mary Howard, Duchess of Richmond and Somerset. Mary had the bravery that wasn't often shown by a woman during this time period. She wasn't afraid to stand up for what she thought was right, and this is why I like her so much. Before I get started talking about Mary Howard, I'd like to thank all of my patrons on Patreon who have been with me from the beginning and have been such a great support to me. I don't have any new patrons since last week's podcast, so I want to extend another thank you to those who have been with me from the beginning. There are currently 23 of you who support me through Patreon, and I want you to know that your support means the world to me. If you feel you'd like to participate and help further my cause, you can do so as well. If you go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click become a patron, you can choose the monthly level that fits your budget. Otherwise, if you're interested in making a one-time donation like my friend Denise did this week, you can usually find a donation button in one of my articles on TutorsDynasty.com. Or you can send me an email to EnglishHistoryBlogger at gmail.com and I will gladly send you a link. All right, let's get going on the topic for this podcast. Mary Howard was born around 1519 to Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, and his wife, Lady Elizabeth Stafford. You might recognize the name Elizabeth Stafford. This Elizabeth Stafford was the daughter of the ill-fated Edward Stafford, 3rd Duke of Buckingham, who was executed in 1521. This means Mary had both Norfolk and Buckingham blood in her veins. Mary was the only daughter of Thomas Howard and received an education that was appropriate to her standing. It's been said that she was both beautiful and smart, a double threat. Both traits are something that we'll see come into play a little later. In December of 1529, when Mary was 10 years old, Henry VIII asked her father, the Duke of Norfolk, to allow his son, who was Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, to become a companion of his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, at Windsor Castle. At the same time, a marriage was arranged between Mary and Fitzroy. While many have said that the marriage was Norfolk's niece Anne Boleyn's idea, it had always been maintained by Norfolk that it was the idea of the king. However, the marriage between Fitzroy and Mary Howard had definitely been promoted by Anne to help strengthen her ties to the throne. Like the later marriage of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves, there was no dowry expected with this marriage, which was unusual for the time. This may indicate the influence that Anne Boleyn had over the king. Elizabeth Stafford, Mary's mother, was totally against the marriage. Whether she blamed Anne Boleyn for the breakdown of her marriage or was disgusted with the amount of control that she had in negotiations, she was not happy and made it known. Because of this conflict, she was banished from court. When King Henry and Anne Boleyn went to Calais in October 1532, they brought with them Fitzroy, Mary Howard, and Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. Fitzroy and Surrey both stayed in France after the English monarch's departure. Fitzroy was a member of King Francis's privy chamber, and Surrey was also a member of his entourage. While Fitzroy and Surrey were away in France, Anne Boleyn and King Henry were married. Anne was now queen, and Mary Howard was one of her ladies-in-waiting. The young men were called back to England in August of 1533, and merely three months later, Henry Fitzroy and Mary Howard were married at Hampton Court. She was now 14, and he was 15 years old. Because of their youth, the couple were not allowed to live together. Instead, they went back to their respective homes. Henry VIII believed that his late brother Arthur's death may have happened because he had intercourse too young. This was also believed to be what caused the death of Catherine of Aragon's brother Juan. Now here's an interesting note. A few months before the marriage of the young couple, Pope Clement was proposing the marriage of the Earl of Surrey with Lady Mary, the king's daughter. The Pope was hoping that the Howard clan would help promote the cause of Catherine of Aragon. Of course, this marriage never happened. Unfortunately, Mary and Fitzroy would never be able to consummate their marriage, when in July 1536, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond and Somerset, an only male child of Henry VIII, died. 
Since the marriage had never been consummated, King Henry denied his 17-year-old widowed daughter-in-law the vast estates she should have inherited as the widow of the Duke of Richmond and Somerset. Mary, still young, could not remarry until her jointure was settled. King Henry decided to keep it all for himself instead. Because of the greed of the king, Mary was forced to live off the handouts of her father, the Duke of Norfolk, and to sell her jewels in order to have money to live. Expecting her powerful father to help her with his connections to the king, Mary was disappointed by his efforts and had threatened to confront the king in person, herself. Feeling desperate, Mary wrote a letter to Thomas Cromwell, asking him to intercede. Cromwell brought Archbishop Cromner into the fold, and Cromner confirmed that the marriage had been valid, even though it hadn't been consummated. This was exactly what Mary needed. Progress was being made in her case. Around the same time, as Mary was fighting for what was rightfully hers, she was helping Margaret Douglas in her clandestine love affair with her uncle, Lord Thomas Howard. Mary was present as possibly a lookout when these two lovers were able to have some quiet time together. All that came to an end when the king discovered the couple had a pre-contract to marry. Both Thomas and Margaret were sent to the tower, and Mary was saved because the couple insisted that she had never knew of the pre-contract. In the meantime, Mary was being linked with Thomas Seymour for a possible marriage alliance. If she accepted this proposition, she would not get what she had been working so hard for. She was not interested in marrying Seymour. It was merely her father's way of creating ties with the new queen's family. Her brother, the Earl of Surrey, was even more upset about the match than she was. He saw the Seymours as upstarts and didn't want them associated with his noble line. Interestingly enough, the Earl of Surrey had the hots for Anne Stanhope, wife of Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford. Stanhope had rebuffed Surrey. When Hartford found out, he was furious, and it caused a lot of friction between the men. It's been said that in 1537, Surrey was imprisoned at Windsor Castle because he punched Edward Seymour in the face. The reason? Well, Seymour suggested that Surrey favored the rebels in the Pilgrimage of Grace. Surrey wasn't in prison long. This matter of Mary's jointure was not resolved until 1540, after the dissolution of the monasteries. Mary finally received some property and income to live on. When Anne of Cleves became queen, it was thought that Mary would have a place in her household. However, Anne had brought ladies of her own and did not have room for her. Mary's cousin, Catherine Howard, when she became queen, made Mary Lady of the Privy Chamber under the supervision of, get this, Margaret Douglas. After the execution of Queen Catherine, the Howard clan was once again lacking favor with the king. Both Mary Howard and Margaret Douglas were sent away from court for about 17 months. Again, in 1546, Norfolk discussed the marriage of his daughter to Thomas Seymour. Around this time, he had also proposed a few marriages to further bind together the Howard and the Seymour families. This included some of his grandchildren as matches for three of Edward Seymour's children. On the 10th of June, 1546, Henry VIII gave his permission and approval to the proposal. Once again, Mary was not interested in marrying Thomas Seymour. She discussed this problem with her brother, Surrey, who suggested that she discuss it with the king and use her charm and become mistress to the king. This would help in advancing not only her interests, but that of the Howards. Mary was insulted and disgusted by her brother's plan and said she would rather cut her own throat than go along with it. Mary and Henry Howard's relationship would never be the same again, and this would mark the beginning of Surrey's downfall. When her father and brother were arrested in December 1546, Mary did nothing to save them. She even gave testimony against her brother. Mary told the council that her brother had such a distaste for men who were made and not of royal birth, and he said, if God called away the king, they should smart for it. She went on to tell them that he replaced the coronet with a crown on his coat of arms. When Surrey's home was searched, they found more evidence against him, a plate with the arms of Edward the Confessor, even though the only person in the kingdom who could claim that was the king. She also told them about a conversation her brother had with her about becoming the king's mistress. Both her father and brother were charged with treason and sentenced to death. Only her brother would make it to the block because 11 days later, King Henry VIII was dead. 
Norfolk's sentence was halted, and he remained in prison until the reign of Queen Mary. Mary raised her brother's children after his execution and apparently was granted money by Edward VI for doing so. He said that he knew of no finer place for the children to be educated. The date of death for Mary Howard varies. What I do know is she most likely died in December. It's the year that varies. Some reports say 1555, others say 56 or 57. In her three decades of life, Mary Howard witnessed a lot of drama at Tudor Court especially during the reign of her father-in-law. She would have witnessed the downfall of Catherine of Aragon with the subsequent marriages to Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. Imagine all the stories that she could tell. That wraps up this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you once again for joining me. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them on my Facebook page. You can comment on my Patreon page or send me an email at englishhistoryblogger at gmail.com. Thanks again.